Hello and welcome back to Things Made Simple. We come into episode 5 with a YM3812 instrument, but let's be honest, it's not a very good one. Sure, you can play a tune, but if you play a scale a bit on the legato side, I think we can do better. Loads better. Today, we're going to go full 9 voice polyphonic. That's almost a voice for every finger. But first, let's fix the bug that's causing that legato issue. Because we're only using one channel, every time we play a note, we override that channel. But when we let go of a note, we just turn the channel off, regardless of the note that's currently playing. This is why we can play five notes, let go of the first one, and then the fifth note just turns off. To fix this, we're going to have to keep track of the note that we're playing. Let's track that in a new variable called channel note. We can add it at the top of our .h file. In the play note function, we can update this variable to the note that we're currently playing. Now turning the note off will be a little more complicated than just turning the key on register off. So let's add a new function to our library called note off. This function just tests to see if the MIDI note that we're turning off is the same one that we last played. If it is, then it turns the key on property of the channel off. Having a separate function for this might seem like overkill, but we're going to use this function later and we'll grow it to be a little more complicated. Now that we have this new channel note off function, we need to update the handler in the .ino file to use it. Okay, with this bug solved, let's give it a whirl. Yeah, I think this solved that legato issue. And now I think we're ready for polyphony. Let's start with a really simple algorithm and see how that might work. I call this the uh, rotate algorithm because we're going to rotate through each channel every time we play a new note. In order to highlight some of the limitations, I'm going to pretend that we only have three channels instead of the nine that the YM3812 supports. Okay, say you wanted to play a C chord. You press the C key and it plays on channel one. And the E key plays on channel 2, and then the G key plays on channel 3. Great. Now what happens when you go to press the C an octave higher? Well, because we're just rotating through the channels, we're going to jump back to the beginning and overwrite channel 1. That seems fair, right? Okay, let's code this up and then give it a shot. We're going to start in the .ino file. Let's go down to the handle note on function. Here we're using the channel play note function that we wrote in the last video to play a note. This function takes the YM3812 channel that you want to play on, and the MIDI note that you want to play, and then it plays it. When things were monophonic, we just kept using channel 0, but now we need a function that can choose a channel on its own. So we'll call this function note on, and it just takes the MIDI note that you want to play. Let's jump over the .h file now. To fix the last bug, we added this channel note variable to keep track of the last note that was played. But now, we need to keep track of a note for every channel, so let's replace this with an array. And to keep the demonstrations clear, let's continue pretending we only have access to three channels instead of nine. We'll track that in a numChannels variable. We also need a variable to track the channel that we play last so that we can rotate through our three channels whenever a new key gets pressed. We'll call it last channel, because it's the last channel that we've played. Okay, now let's add definitions for our note functions. And I'm going to differentiate these from channel functions below because these are kind of like a layer abstracted from the functions that manipulate the channel properties. We'll call them note functions. Okay, cool. We have these defined. Let's go write implementations for them. The note on function only does three things. First, it increments the last channel variable by adding one to it and then modding it by the number of channels. You might remember this from the last video where we used the modulus operator to rotate through a set of values. Then it saves the MIDI note number into the channel notes array so we know which note is associated with that channel. Then it uses the channel play note function from before to actually turn the note on. Pretty simple. Now let's go take a look at the note off function. To get this to work, we need to loop through each of the channels and see if that entry matches the MIDI note that we want to turn off. If it is, then we just turn that channel off. Okay, I think this is going to work. Let's give this a shot. Well, we have polyphony. 
But I think there's something odd here. See, I can play a chord, but then if I repeat the bottom note while I'm holding the top two, then those top two notes go away. To understand why, let's take a look at the algorithm and see what's going on. Say we play the three notes of our C chord, C, E, G, but then we let go of the D. Now, when we play the C an octave higher, it's still going to overwrite that first C, even though there's this unused channel. And that's because we're just blindly rotating through the channels. Clearly, this algorithm isn't the best, but let's see if we can make it better. Just like before, we're going to play the C, E, G of the C chord, but this time we'll also keep track of when we play the keys. I'm just going to use simple numbers like 0, 1, 2 for this, but later we're actually going to use timestamps for this. Now, when we let go of the E, we'll turn it off, but we'll also keep track of when we turned it off. Then, when we turn on the high C, we'll override a track that's currently turned off. And this leads to our first rule. If any channel is off, use that channel. Well, that's almost true, but there's one more thing we need to think about. When you press a key, you're actually triggering the envelope for that note. You get the attack and the decay, and then the note stays on until you let go. And at that point, the note starts its release cycle. For things to sound as natural as possible, we want to allow that release cycle to go on as long as it can. And that's why we include those timestamps. So let's change the rule to be choose the channel that's been off the longest. Okay, back to our scenario. We now have all three channels playing. What happens when we press a fourth note? Well, just like before, we want to overwrite the note that's been playing the longest, which is rule number two. And we only use rule number two if rule number one fails because there's no open channels. So how might we go about implementing this? Well, the first thing we're going to have to do is create a container to track all this extra information that we're storing about channels. Uh, I created a data structure called YM channel that contains the MIDI note associated with the channel, a flag that indicates if the note's playing, and the timestamp with the milliseconds since the state of the flag was changed, whether it was turned on or turned off. Then down where we define the channel notes array, we're going to have to swap that so that it's an array of these structures instead of just an array of integers. We could rename this too to something more generic, maybe uh, channel states. We also need to add a function that can seek out the next available channel using the rules that we just kind of established. Let's call it channel get next, and it's going to return an integer indicating the channel to use. Okay, now let's flip over to the .cpp file and take a crack at implementing it. First, we need to create some variables that keep track of the channel that's been on the longest and the channel that's been off the longest. We'll call them on-channel and off-channel. And I'm going to set them both to 0xff, which is actually an invalid channel. But this will allow me to know whether or not I've overwritten these variables with a new channel. We also need to keep track of the oldest timestamps. And here, we'll set them both to the current time in milliseconds. Now we'll need to loop through each of the entries in our channel states array and check to see if each of the channels is turned on or turned off. If the state's on, then we need to compare the channel's last state change time to the current oldest time that we're tracking. If this one's been on longer, then we can set oldest on time to be the current channel's state change time and on channel to be the current channel number. Okay, now we have to do the same thing, but for when the channel's turned off. And instead, we're gonna update off channel and oldest off time. Groovy, okay, so now we've got on channel and off channel, and those are gonna contain the channel number that's been on the longest and off the longest. Thinking back to our algorithm, our preference is to return the channel that's been off the longest, as long as there is one. And we can use the fact that we set off channel to FF at the beginning to see if we've overwritten that with an actual channel that's been turned off. If we did, it's going to be less than FF. So all we need to do now is uh, check to see if off channel is less than FF. And if it is, then return it because it's going to contain the channel number that's been off the longest. And if it equals FF, it means all of the channels are turned on and we need to return on channel and that's going to contain the channel that's been on the longest. Okay, cool. That's the channel get next function. Now let's see how we actually use it. 
Okay, so jumping down to the note on function, we can remove this code where we're incrementing the last note pointer, and instead we can uh, replace it with the channel get next function. We also need to update the properties of the channel, including setting the note state to true and updating the state changed timestamp to be the current time. And then down in the note off function, we need to make some similar changes. We'll track the timestamp of when the note was turned off. And we'll set the state of the note to false, which is basically off. OK, let's compile this. OK, looks like I have a typo here. And oh, it looks like I forgot to add the MIDI note property. OK, third time's the charm. All right, let's give it a go. Yeah, I think that's working. Even when I hold the top notes and play another note, the top notes keep playing. Okay, it's time to take the gloves off. Let's set this back to full nine voice polyphony. All we need to do is grab the constant that defines the number of channels for the YM3812 and swap it in for the threes that we were using before. Okay, let's try this out. All right, well, I may be a little rusty, but I can definitively say that Beethoven sounds better when you can play more than one note at a time. Adding polyphony was a pretty big step, and I think this is starting to sound a heck of a lot more like a, an actual good instrument. And I think in the next video, we're gonna move on from polyphony. We're gonna start to talk a little bit more about the way that patches work and how to uh, make that a little bit more versatile. It's gonna require quite a few changes to the code, but it's gonna be worth it because it's gonna allow us to do things like play multiple instruments at the exact same time and uh, you know, ultimately swap between things like different drum sounds and, and stuff like that. So um, stick with us. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you wanna see the next video or hit that notification icon. Yeah, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Things Made Simple.